Welcome everyone to the Midlife Reinvention Podcast, a podcast for women in transition in their careers and life. I'm your host, Kavita Ahuja, and my goal with this podcast is to inspire you to realize your true inner power and potential and to help you unleash all that resides within you and bring it out into the world with confidence. If you may be going through transitions in your career or your life and wondering what's next, I'm here to tell you that you can do this, and I want you to believe and say with confidence, it's my time now. To this end, I interview incredible women for this podcast who share their stories of reinvention and who will give you their advice on how to overcome the obstacles in your way to reach your vision for yourself in your next stage of life. Today, I'm very pleased to have on the show Sandy Rosenthal. If any of you have heard about the famous environmental activist, Erin Brockovich, you will be interested to learn about Sandy's story, which is remarkably similar, and one of the reasons I had to bring her on the show today. At the age of 48, Sandy realized that her entire life had prepared her to stand up to the most powerful engineering outfit in the world and win. After Hurricane Katrina and the federal levy failures in New Orleans, Sandy Rosenthal founded the nonprofit levies.org with 25,000 supporters worldwide. Her book, Words Whispered in Water, is about how she led an investigative team to expose the culprit in the levy breach disaster, the Army Corps of Engineers, and how the agency spent millions covering up its mistakes. Sandy is an advocate for the 62% of the American population living by levees. She hosts a weekly podcast called Beat the Big Guys, where she coaches her national audience on how to take on the big guys in their own communities. In her spare time, Sandy plays tennis five days a week, practices yoga, teaches her dogs silly tricks, and spends time every month with her two grandchildren in San Francisco. Thank you for being here, Sandy. It's really an honor to have you here. Welcome. I'm delighted. Thank you. How are you today? I'm wonderful. I'm happy to say after COVID, it seemed that I kept catching cold after cold after cold to yeah. make up for the three years of having nothing. And I never did catch COVID. I'm very fortunate. But oh, wow. That's great. I'm very fortunate. I think I'm yeah. just lucky. But yeah. I feel fabulous. Thank you. Fantastic. You look great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So Sandy, I kind of referred to your story in the introduction, and I guess we could just get right into it. And and uh, tell me, how did you decide to take on the issue about the flooding in New Orleans and uh, during Hurricane Katrina? And what what circumstances led you to to that? I guess in your life, maybe just tell us a little bit about your reinvention story. I guess. Well, certainly there was an event, an event that the entire world watched on television for, for weeks. And that was the day the levees broke during a actually a moderate hurricane in New Orleans. In Mississippi, it was a huge storm. But in, in New Orleans, we had the outer rings. But the storm surge from those outer rings of a moderate hurricane were enough to break the levees, which should have held. And so mm -hmm. that was the kaboom event in my life that upended my life and the life of everyone I know in the city of New Orleans. And I ended up having to relocate so that my child could go to school. My one remaining child, my other two had already gone off to college and one graduated, but I still had a child mm -hmm. relocated in another city and, and had to cope. And throughout this coping, I kept feeling like the world was being told a lie that the world was being told that we deserved what happened to us and that we're all stupid for living in New Orleans and imbeciles for wanting to rebuild. And I just felt in my bones that story was backward. So mm -hmm. I I went on a quest and to find out the truth. And I with about a month after Hurricane Katrina, which I explain all the details in my book, but about a month after Hurricane Katrina, I felt that I had the truth in my hands and I set out little me. I'm not an engineer and I'm and I, with no public speaking experience decided I was going to tell the world the true story. And it's it's crazy. Wow. But but a huge life altering event can make someone do and what in hindsight is crazy things. 
Yes. Crazy meaning that's impossible. You won't be able to do it. You know, mm-hmm. Who do you think you are? So right. that was that's what spurred me to action, this event that affected me and everyone I know. And then you know, one thing led to another. I, I didn't figure everything out overnight. It did take a couple of years and then and then even more time. But but that's what spurred me to action. And keep in mind, as, as I the reason I compare myself to Erin Brockovich is she had no lawyer training. And she managed to do what she did because she Mm -hmm. believed in what she was doing. And that's the similarity. Me, I had no engineering training, no special special training at all, Mm -hmm. but pulled this off. And and that's the focus of my book. And that and and a lot of that is very relevant to your show, which I look forward Mm -hmm. to talking about more. Yes, thank you for for sharing that. I mean, you said you didn't have any experience, but what you did have was belief in what you did. And the courage to go for it, despite, you said, not having the qualifications that people would think you'd have to have in order to go after these these big corporations, right? So can you tell me a little bit or tell our audience a little bit about kind of, I mean, you said you didn't have the courage. Was How did it lead up in your life? Tell me a little bit about your life. I understand you, you had a bit of a speech impediment as you were growing up. And how did you overcome that and gain even greater confidence that a lot of people wouldn't ever imagine having to do what you did? So tell us a little bit about your backstory. So this is, I'm going to talk to your listeners about two things. What gave me the courage and something that very few people understand. Most people are able to understand glasses. You put on glasses and you can see. And you can see often as, as good as a 20-year-old, assuming you don't have you know, severe eyesight issues, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People believe that if someone puts in hearing aids, they have normal hearing and they have the hearing of a 20-year-old. Not true at all. Hearing is very, very different. It's different in, in almost every way. And in my case, I was born with hearing that's not normal, lesser than normal hearing. But- mm-hmm. Here's a the crazy thing. When you talk about somebody such as myself, it's called hearing loss. Well, I never had the hearing in the first place. So how could I lose it? It's it's just it, the words, the word choice to explain it is crazy. But mm-hmm. without getting into all of that, I'm going to write an article about that one day. But yeah. I was born without normal hearing. And when your hearing is different from everybody else, you hear things differently. And I'm going to give you an example. When someone said the word chicken, as in buck, buck, the ham, I hear yeah. chicken. I hear chicken. That's what I yeah. hear. So I said it. And that's what every little child does. They repeat what they hear. Sure. And and that was just one of the sounds that I said wrong. I said lots and lots of sounds wrong. I went to public school 55 years ago and no one sent me to speech therapy. And so I grew up with all of these odd little, little um, speech issues for, for mm-hmm. lack of a better word okay. mm-hmm. then combine that with my hearing there's there's not a word to describe hearing blindness but yes. hearing disability so yes. combine those two yeah it was a bit of a struggle and it took me years I learned to lip read my lip reading is very good and uh, now in a crowded restaurant I can hear just fine <laughs> if really? I can see you I can hear you <laughs> really <laughs> um, oh, I got a competitive advantage now but yeah. but uh, but going back to my past I'd struggled with hearing. I struggled with speaking. And then finally, at the age of 40, I took speech therapy and I practiced. My jaw was sore from from working on it. I had to re-speak all of my words. But the beauty of it is you can practice all day long, every day. Mm -hmm. So by the time the levees broke, I would had this new self-confidence in my speaking that when the time came for me to do something about it, to do something mm. about this problem that I saw, I had the confidence in my speaking. Wow. Which so that that that's the timing thing is luck. Uh, I yes. really honestly say I don't think I would have taken on this cause if if I didn't have my confidence and my ability to be understood. That's incredible. I honestly like firstly to be able to overcome what we can like people would think is a normal, like we take it for granted, let's put it this way, right? When we have a normal hearing or Mm. vision Mm -hmm. and to have you explain it in in the way you did and that you hear differently. And 
it seems normal to you, but when people listen to you, it's like, oh, that's mm-hmm. what's happening here, right? So you must have gone through a lot of a lot of pressures in your when you were in school, a lot of maybe bullying. I'm not sure, but the fact that you overcame that to do what you did that takes so much courage. If Amazing. I can give your listeners, excuse me, if I can give your listeners one takeaway, shouting does not help. <laughs> shouting mm-hmm. does not help. It makes it worse, actually. Yeah. Because yes. shouting changes the words. Hmm. It changes just just if someone ever says what, excuse me, just repeat it again, a little little bit slower, a little more clear, hmm. clearly. It doesn't mean that you have to shout something if you're passionate about it, right? You can just speak it with emphasis, right? <laughs> well, actually, what I was referring to, and I probably wasn't clear, but whenever you, someone says to you, what? And especially if it's an older person and you figure, oh, oh this I person's see. hearing, yeah. This, this person's hearing is, is not as good as it should be. And it is a common thing for people to shout the second time. That's what I was referring oh, to. Oh, okay. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, yeah, I and that. it I, doesn't yeah. help. It doesn't help. There's no. actually a book out with the, with the title, Shouting Doesn't Help. Okay. <laughs> written by someone with this with similar issues as, as, yeah. as I do. I didn't, I didn't realize that, actually. My, my dad, he's just turned 90, and he... He really was resistant on getting hearing aids because he said you put them on and you can't you can't hear like you hear all the external background and he finally found one that he likes and sometimes I do that and it's just a natural thing like if if he doesn't hear me the first time then I I might say it louder but that's a really good tip that you share and uh, and your dad has had the same experience that I've gone through I've tried them as well they don't fit. Your ear is sensitive. They don't fit yeah. very well. Yeah. And then you have to go back and get them adjusted. And then then the sound of silverware on a plate is too loud. And you got to adjust it. And you go back and you go back and forth. And eventually you just get fed up and you throw them in a drawer. And it's yeah. probably billions of dollars worth of hearing aids in a drawer yes. in this country. <laughs> yes, yes. So, Sandy, I just wanted to go back to what you how you explained how you've got the courage to speak up. And I just wanted to maybe if you could give, say to our listeners who maybe somebody is considering leading a cause such as you, you are, and that they're really passionate about, but they're, they have fear or they're fearful. They're not confident in themselves. They don't, they don't know what to do or how to go about doing it. What are some pieces of advice you would give these ladies or these women who might be doing, considering that? That's a great question. And what I'm going to do is give pieces of advice for someone just getting started. Okay. Cause that's the make or break time. You either do or you don't. And mm-hmm. in the beginning, don't worry that you don't know everything and do not be concerned. If, if like me, you're not an expert in that thing that you want to work with. You know, Erin Brockovich, like I said, didn't know anything about law, but she didn't let that stop her because you will Find people who can help you with Mm -hmm. these expertise. If you if you see a wrong in your community and you stand up and you say, I'm going to do something about this, I want to fix this. The experts will come to you the moment you speak out. They will come Mm -hmm. to you. They will Mm -hmm. seek you out. They will find you out. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about money. There are lots of people who would love to take a public stance and be a public face, but can't because they're concerned about job security Mm. or concerned about who knows what. These are the people that will be happy to fund you. And if if you if you're not a 501c3, you don't have to reveal who your funders are. Okay, Mm -hmm. so the money will come, the experts will come. Don't worry that you don't know all the answers. All you need to do is ask the questions. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to do. Ask the questions. And it's a, it's, a, it's a simple formula that I once got applauded for by a news reporter for NBC National News, a CBS National News. She said, all you have to do is ask a reasonable question, make a valid point and back it up with data. Hmm. That's it. That's the secret formula. And you will get your message heard. You will even get something that is very valuable. And that is media and press coverage because it's free and it really helps you further the reach of your message. So one last time, because it's so important, ask a reasonable question, make a valid point, back it up with the data. Hmm. That's great. That's so important because often, and, and many times when I, when I coach women, 
and they're wanting to do something like this. And they're in a, in a stage in life or they're at a tr- transition point where they want to do the next thing, whether that's leave a job or maybe pursue a passion that they have that's inside of them or whatever it may be. And it all comes down to a little bit of that fear, right? It's that fear of I'm I'm not qualified enough. I'm not good enough. What will people think? How do I even get started? I can't do this, right? <laughs> so I love that. You don't have to be an expert. Don't worry about the money. It'll come. And experts, and, and will, come. experts will come. Experts will come. Yeah, yeah. As long as you take, and I always say, you don't need to know, you don't need to know, have it all figured out. It's just about taking the one step and going with your gut a lot of the time. And it feels like that's what you told me in the beginning is that you had that. What did you say? I wrote it down. I I've, I've probably said something like felt it in my bones. You felt it just, in your bones. That's yes. it. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. And that's so important I, to listen to, right? That that voice right. or that feeling inside of us that tells us that something is wrong and I want to do something about it. And there's just one other thing. And don't be concerned that you might get criticism. That's, that is evidence that you're right, or at mm-hmm. least at the minimum on the right path. So if you get criticism, and it will come, it will come from the people that benefit from keeping the status quo. If you're out there to change something, there are people who benefit from things not changing. Those are the folks that will criticize. And and what's the first thing they do? Go after the messenger. Mm-hmm. They'll go after you. And here's a here's a common one. They'll as they said did to me. Well, I'm not an engineer. Why would anyone listen to me? Okay. And you just meet. I actually devoted an entire episode of my podcast on what you say to someone when they go after you. And there's mm-hmm. so, so many, the number one thing is just be polite about it and, and, yeah. and recognize what's happening. They, yes. they, they don't have a leg to stand on. They can't argue the facts. Oh, well, let's just go after the messenger. Right, right. So, and it will come, but just don't fear it. And especially when you've got, when you've got your belief in your bones, as we talked about, and you've got Kavita and Sandy to help you. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. I think uh, I think that's so true. And so oftentimes what happens, I don't know if you experienced this, but I, I I certainly did, is that when even even people who are are closest to you, right? Like maybe family or close friends and and you tell them that you're gonna be doing this thing or you're going after your passion or whatever, oftentimes they'll be questioning that. And it's not out of a place of negativity. It's just a place of of caring that they don't want you to they don't want you to hurt, be hurt or fail, or they want you to be comfortable, right? And so I often tell women that that's okay, but comfort's not going to get you and make you move ahead. So it's good to listen to them, but also then to say, you know, thanks, but I, I, I've got this. Any comments on that? For you? You're beautifully worded. Yes. I couldn't have said it better myself. And even though family is important, I couldn't have gotten through the past 18 years without my family Mm -hmm. supporting me. And while family support is important, their approval when you decide to go on your quest or their approval when you when you make a decision on the direction that your group will take is not required or necessary. And often you're going to do the opposite of what they suggest. And, and, but so I wouldn't, I guess my takeaway from that is don't have your family be everything. Your family Mm -hmm. is part of who you are and part of your support group, but not, they're not the only support group. There's also friends and colleagues. Mm Mm-hmm. And then, and oh, the people you meet, all those people, the day you do open your mouth and the day people do come to you and say, you're right, I'd like to join you. You've created this huge network of of folks who will become your friends. Yes. So how did you get the courage to do this? How did I get the courage to do this? I think it was anger, anger at being told we deserved what happened to us just for living in New Orleans, Mm -hmm. anger at being blaming the victims. And a a lot of people died. The Mm -hmm. official count recently came out as recently as January of this year, but nearly 1400 souls were lost within a few hours. 
so it was it was anger, it was anger. that yeah. how could how could we be blamed for this disaster which was not our fault Mm-hmm. And and I'll, I'll be honest, is that anger, that that, that that outrageousness made me decide I had to do something about it. And it and I tried to find someone else who was already doing the work that I felt needed to be done. Mm-hmm. And I spent a full week, which at the at the time I felt that seemed like an eternity in me, to me, a yeah. week. But I spent yeah. a week looking for someone else, found nobody. And and then I said, well, I need a spokesperson. And I spent another week, wasted another week, trying to find someone to be a spokesperson, someone famous, which is hard to do. Yeah. It's, it's hard to do. So I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to do it. Right. And and then I said, until I find a spokesperson. Well, to, so to this day, I still am the spokesperson. I'm the founder and president. But I will I will point out this is a if, if I can. I'm just going to take a few seconds to Please, say sure. if, if you can get a famous celebrity to speak for your cause, get get them yes. if you can. But you don't have to. You right. don't. It's not critical. It's not necessary. But if you can get one, get one. And I actually did uh, was able to get the, the great actor, John Goodman. Oh, Nice. Yeah, but that was later. That came a couple of years later. So yes. you can be you can be your spokesperson. And in yes. fact, I'll I'll say this: you're the best because you will become you, yeah. you will become the best person through your your expertise that you've developed and through your your own personal passion. Yes, and I believe that's so important because the 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 reason the why that we do things. Sometimes it, it, it actually should be more important than it's bigger than us. Do you know what I mean? Like the the the, the belief, the passion, whether it's anger or belief that this is wrong, the reason behind it should become bigger than us. Like we we shouldn't be like, oh, if we have something to say, should say it and not worry about like what are people going to say about us. So it kind of take it away from us ourselves, if, if that makes sense. Right, always. I, in fact, I yes. never used the word uh, I. I just said it just now, I. But but whenever talking about the, the organization that, that I created, I always say we. Yes. I'm in a habit of saying we. We did yeah. this. We did that. We did that. Yeah. And if anyone says thank you to me, I said, well, you know, it was it was my idea in the beginning. That and my son, who was just 15 years old at the time. Wow. Amazing. That's really great. Really great. So Sandy, you mentioned your podcast. Mm-hmm. It's called Beat the Big Guys. And so tell me a little bit about that. And what is the aim of the podcast? And I know that we talked a little bit about Aaron Brockwich before and how does how how is your how are your story similar? And what is your what is the, the aim of the podcast and some of the things that you talk sure. about? The, for, for years, the idea of having a podcast like this was always a a fantasy for me because Mm -hmm. for years and years and years, I had to subject myself. That's probably not a good word because every interview I had, I was grateful for it. It was an opportunity to improve and further the reach of the message. But all those interviews, I wished I could pick the questions. Mm -hmm. I have been asked, why did you decide to do this a thousand times? Why did Mm -hmm. I decide to take on the Army Corps of Engineers a thousand times? And I've always thought, I wish I could do my own show and talk about how to beat the big guys, whoever they may be. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so this is a fantasy that I've had for a long time because really what I did, anyone can do. If I could do it, anyone could do it. They were just a couple of little tools and tricks. And there was no beat the big guys podcast. When I started out, I had to learn by the seat of my pants. Yes. I had some help, but I had to learn a lot by the seat of my pants. There's a lot of things I wish someone had told me way, way back in the beginning. So this is a fantasy. And the other huge fantasy is me with my speech and my hearing. I'm I'm actually doing a podcast. How crazy is that? That's amazing. But, so, Congratulations. So that's the second I, I, I think you said you just uh, finished recording your 78th episode. <laughs> is that right? 78th episode. Wow. I, I Congratulations. I wanted to to help help people with their causes. I felt like I had something to offer. Yeah. And and that well, was that was the did. other part of the fantasy. Last but not least, I also now I realize when you interview someone, that's a lot of work because you've got to do all your homework. You've got to know the person you're interviewing. You've got to know a lot about them. You've got to have good questions lined up. I had no clue how hard mm-hmm. it was to be the interviewer. Yes. 
yeah. until I was on the other side. So all those out, all those people out there who've interviewed me in the past, thank you. I had no idea how hard your job was. <laughs> that's that's one of the things I love about this. Actually, is really understanding the person that I'm talking to and really researching their background and and meeting them ahead of time and and because it's easy to ask general questions, but it's it's, it's more difficult to really get to the heart of, of why somebody is doing what they're doing. And so you said that you give tips on how to beat the big guys. Is there like, I know that you probably have a hundred, but <laughs> maybe a few to, to kind of, well, I can't can kind of share. I do. I do. I still hope that people uh, come listen to an a episode or two of my yeah, show. We'll have it in your, in, in their show notes for sure. Great. Great. Yes. yes but yes. I figured out after, I don't know, I don't know, 50 episodes or so of listening to all the different types of big guys out there it could be big oil, big pharma, big ag, big hog. There's all kinds of, of forces out there that, that, that we need to beat. A homeowners association. Mm-hmm. That, was, that was my most recent one. So I came to the conclusion after all these interviews that the big guys are are no different from the bullies in the fourth grade playground. No different. And Mm -hmm. once you frame whoever they are in terms of bullies on the fourth grade playground, all of a sudden they're imminently and absolutely beatable when you think of them that way. And I and I and I go through. I actually devoted a, an episode to how the big guys are no different from fourth grade kids. Mm. Okay, and I could tell you now if we have just a minute or two. Please, yeah, sure. Ahead. Okay, so well, first of all, they're they're big, and they're yeah. usually bigger in stature. The fourth grade bully. Why is an, is another conversation? But they're usually big. These bullies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they're yeah. not. But they're not smarter. In fact, they're usually not as smart as you are. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's issue number one. They're bigger, but so what? So what? They're bigger. The second is they're they're thin skinned. They they have low self esteem. The mm. big guys are deathly afraid of anything that can harm their goodwill, their public image. Mm-hmm. Deathly afraid. And then the third thing is the the these bullies because they're generally not as smart as you and because they have this thin-skinned mentality that they're they're scared all the time, really, they're really scared, is they make mistakes Mm -hmm. and they make big mistakes. And you, uh, all you have to do is is wait and and recognize. And when you see that mistake, just exploit it, draw attention to it, shine the light on it. And that's when you can do what I mentioned before, raise a valid question, make a valid point and, mm-hmm. and back it up with data. So anyway, when you think of the big guys as just the the, uh, na- mm. the, the bullies on the fourth grade playground, it's, it's a piece of cake. That's amazing. So they're bigger in stature. They're mm-hmm. thin skinned. They're not they have low self-esteem and they make mistakes Be- because yes. of their over. The, you know, they think just because they're big, they're invincible. Yes. Yes. And they make mistakes because of that. And they yes. all do. They all yeah. do. Huh. And it's interesting. You've called it beat the big guys, right? So and you notice I don't ca- call them the bad guys. Or the, I was going to, I was the, just going to say big guys. the girls. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> because I, I was just going to ask you because as women, there's that added, I guess, perception that we can't beat the big guys. And tell me a little bit about that is in from your experience and for women predominantly listening to this podcast, like as women, how do we, how do we do that? Is there, is there a different formula or is there something sure. more difficult for us? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, even though yeah. it's 2023, we're not there yet. I've recently finished a book, When Women Stood, about how far women have come and how a lot of the women have improved, have improved life for women in sports. Sports mm-hmm. is a big area, but there's an entire book devoted to that named Alex Allred. Mm-hmm. But but two things real quick. When I selected the title, Beat the Big Guys, in my mind, guys was gender neutral. It's a common phrase. Oh, yeah. well, you guys come over here, but you guys can mean men and women. Sure, yeah, sure. So it was meant to be gender neutral, but you raise a good point and it's hard. You know, it, it, I spent a long time trying to come up with a title and I finally come up with a title and no, it's I a great title. I didn't, I didn't mean it okay. that way. I just, oh, you did more, okay. more, okay. more about how okay. as women we can be okay. the big guys. Good. 
Yeah, yeah. And it fits more different. Even though it would it would be a valid point, even though you didn't mean that. But as women, oh absolutely. And Mm -hmm. there have been many times in my in my work leading levies.org that I would receive responses from from some some of the the naysayers that, that were very confusing to me. And it mm-hmm. would take one some of my male colleagues to say to me, Sandy, don't pay any attention to Mr. X. He's a male chauvinist. And I would mm-hmm. go, and I would my response would be, Oh. So so I'm I, I went to an all women's college. And when you're at an all women's college for four years, you're told you can do everything. And it doesn't occur to you that you can't. You can. And so yeah. when I do see statements that are born from this attitude, this old fashioned attitude, and sure enough, these Mr. X's and Y's were often 10 or more years older than me now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with each passing day, things are improving, but we're not there yet. Yes. That's wonderful. And and Sandy, have you, with your inspiration and your podcast and 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 your movement, like have have you seen some in your work? Have you seen some other people stand up to things that they're passionate about? Like I think you met Erin Brockovich. Have have you know how she inspired? She's probably inspired a ton of people to do it. Like, can you? Is there some examples of women or other people who have taken your examples and ran with it, or? Just I, uh, a gentleman listened to my podcast and after listening to it, he says, you know what? I said, I've, uh, after listening to what you did, I says, I've decided I'm going to, to do something about it as well. Mm-hmm. And I don't, don't really know what it was. And he didn't offer and I didn't ask, but that was, that was the whole reason I did the podcast. And, mm-hmm. and we want and to inspire people, if, right? Yeah. Right. And yeah, even yeah, if it was yeah. just that one person, it would be, in my mind, sure. it would be worth it. And I certainly hope that there's a lot more. I can't say that there's a lot of people that have rushed to me to say, oh, I've decided to take 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 it on, take mm-hmm. on something in my community because of what I've said. But I, I that could change tomorrow. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. Just from from listening to you, I'm motivated to like because if if you see some injustice in your community or in in the world, like and and you have an inkling or a desire or as you said in your bones, it feel like it in your bones. You want to make a difference, then to do it, you know, take your example. So. That's wonderful. So, so what's uh, what's what's in it? What's your mission now? And is is there what what are you doing now? And what what's next for you? Well, I'm I'm enjoying doing the podcast so much that I'm going to keep doing doing the podcast and hopefully continue to to inspire others. But the uh, the big project, believe it or not, the 20th anniversary of the levee breach event in New Orleans is two years from now. Really? And, wow. and I'm already, already have big plans for what, what's going to happen on that anniversary. We'll have, there'll be a gala, there'll be a special bike ride of all the levy breach events and, and all kinds of things. And the, what we're going to unveil in one month from now at the anniversary of the 18th anniversary of the levy breach event is we are initiating a campaign to make sure that every single engineering student in this country, when they graduate from from college, that they have a thorough understanding of engineering disasters and failures and what can be learned from them. Because currently right now, there is no requirement that they have that kind of preparation when they go out into the world. None. That is incredible. That's really awesome. I know. It's mind bending. Well, I mean, it's awesome that you're initiating this in schools because, yeah, I mean, if they don't, if they don't, if they're not taught it, then Right. So yeah. how are they to know? So <laughs> how are they to know? And and it's always yeah. been assumed that they had been. Nope, they're not. And wow. so we, we, we've started a campaign to make that happen. And we'll be kicking that off in about what's today, the 25th. And today? 27th. Okay. So yeah, the, um, <laughs> there, we, there we go. I've the 24th. Sorry. Yes. 24th. I'm ahead of myself. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> a little less than a month. We're going to be kicking off, kicking off that campaign. In How are you, is that uh, like nationwide kind of thing? Or? It's a press conference. And yes, it's yeah. absolutely nationwide. Wow. Well, we that's, need to make sure that amazing. every engineering college in the country, mm-hmm. uh, not just the ones here in Louisiana. Yeah, that's uh, that's a wonderful cause. And, and I find that uh, young people now, they really are really motivated to make a difference in their communities, even maybe more so than we were when we were growing up. I, I, I feel, I just feel like there's, you know, with the environmental issues and so many other things that 
people are young ones are really taking the younger you know the, the younger. Lead, yeah they're taking the lead i don't know if that, yes. if you find that but that's what i see in my i do t- i absolutely mind. do yes wonderful well this has been fascinating sandy and i just i don't know if there's anything you want to kind of maybe leave off with some comments women who are listening or as i said before they're kind of in this stage where they're really wanting to do something with their life more than that they have inside but are held back by fears or other obstacles and they just need to develop that courage muscle i guess to to go for it so anything that you'd like to kind of end with or just i guess it's just one last thing is if, if when you're out there and you're giving your elevator speech it's important to get your cars down to an elevator speech okay so yeah. when you're out there in your elevator or on a ski lift or wherever you are giving giving your short speech on what you do and why you're doing it and if someone comes back with a with a with a question that absolutely has nothing to do with the point it's a, what they're doing is they're trying to change the subject and it's 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 a similar thing to criticizing you okay it's changing the subject and just recognize it when it happens and smile and let it go and consider it evidence that you're on the right track and you're doing the right thing because mm. if if they can't ask you a ask you a a relevant you know intelligent question yes. about your cause it means that they don't you've bothered them somehow yeah. And rather than discuss it, they'd rather just change the subject. Ignore it. So yes. Consider yes. that evidence that you're, that you're on the right track and <laughs> yes. on the right path. It's a bit of a victory, right? Yes. That's wonderful. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. That's a great point. I never really Changing thought of it that way. Changing the subject. Yeah. I never really thought of it that way. It's yeah. a very good point. Mm-hmm. Very good mm-hmm. point. So, so Sandy, tell us how people can reach you and where they can find you and, and all that good stuff. We'll have everything in the show notes, like I said, but if you want to Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I like to keep things simple. We we called our website levies.org. Yes. <laughs> L-E-V-E-E-S dot org. And if someone wants to reach me, again, simple. It's my name, Sandy Rosenthal dot net. Any two. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And yes, I, I, I'm actually encourage everyone to listen to your podcast as well. Beat the big guys. And we'll have that in the link. And it sounds very interesting and inspiring for, for many. So good luck with that. And congratulations on achieving 78 episodes already. So that's wonderful. And good luck to you. And congratulations for all the amazing work that you've done and to bring these, this initiative forward. It's important. And it's, an, and it's a lesson for all of us that if we have something in our minds and our hearts that we feel is wrong to to really go for it and, and don't worry about so much about us, about ourselves, about what people are going to think, but about what the ultimate ultimate uh, result will be, right? And oh, the friends you'll make. Yeah, absolutely. Like we've made. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. yes. Well, thank you again, Sandy. I really appreciate you being on the show and good luck. Okay. Take care. Bye.